So, um, welcome. Uh, I'm Richard Mensing. I'm the Director of Sports Performance and Athletic Development here at John McEnroe Tennis Academy. And to my right, your left, is Sir Brian Helm. You want to introduce yourself or show all Hello, everyone. Hello. How are we? Good? My name is Brian Helm. I'm one of the Associate Directors of John McEnroe Tennis Academy. If you guys have any questions at any point, please ask. Hopefully I can answer it. If not, I know Richard can. Well, about that. Um, I know all of you and your children, except for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, he's never stepped foot. <laughs> That's why I don't know you or your son. <laughs> But it's never too late. But thank God somebody's here to represent the family. Let's, let's, let's figure this out. What days does he come? Uh, Sunday, Tuesday, and Friday. All right. Well, he's never been in here as much as I've been in here, I guess. Now that's quite all right. <laughs> yes. No, perfect. Well, glad to have you. And please tell him anytime he wants to find his way up here. We'd love to have him. Basil can attest to it being sure, fun. Sure, he knows Leo. Right, so there you go. I would write him in one day. So, uh, today's seminar is uh, about giving you guys a better understanding of uh, prepping for a tournament, uh, as what, whether it's local or traveling, as well as proper nutrition and hydration. Um, they kind of are seamless, so we will probably talk you know, in conjunction with each other about as we move through the course of prepping for the tournament, you know, a week out, what you need to do, um, leading all the way to in-match, intra-match, and then post-match. And often in junior tennis, uh, unlike in the pro tour, you're playing uh, 20 matches in a day. So there is a fine line and a delicate balance on uh, proper hydration, enough hydration, too much hydration, and certainly with nutrition. Um, but we're gonna start off as if we are going to a tournament uh, a week out. And uh, Ryan will start off. The goals for today, you can see up on the TV, Pretty much we want to go step by step and give you guys an overview of what should happen leading up. The equipment is first, footwear. Try to make sure the kid's not going to get blisters. Shoes have tread left. If there is no tread left, what I would like you to do is have them break the shoe in before the tournament. Numerous, numerous times we have a kid put on shoes on Friday and they go to the match. And by Saturday morning they wake up and they have blisters. Never fails. So if you notice the treads are low, start having them wear them during the week. Usually I would even wear them at home for 20 to 30 minutes just to slowly break them in and then bring them onto the court a couple days later. I would not sit there and throw them on and have them play with them. They're too stiff, they're not broken in and that can lead to the blisters. So usually the kid is not that good at checking out the shoes and saying, oh my goodness, I have no tread left. So it would be great for the parent as hopefully they leave them by the door or wherever they leave them, you check them. And then you teach them by saying, hey, what do your shoes look like? Do you have shoelaces? Shoelaces are good and the tread's good. Then we're pretty much set. The next part of that sorry I forgot, is surface. Not so much probably you're not going to be buying specific shoes for clay, hard, there's even grass court shoes, so on and so forth. But for clay specific, say you're traveling, you're going to be on clay for a good portion of time, you should get to clay court shoes. They will help them immensely. So if your son's going to go to Florida and he's going to be on clay for three weeks, or daughter, Get clay court shoes. Let them have them. It helps massively. Can I make a suggestion also? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I recommend my kids to have 
actually two parachutes. Um, one that they keep that is pretty much brand new, and they only use those on clay courts. Okay, so they don't use them on hard courts, so they don't wear out the tread that quickly on those. So then they always kind of have a pair that they can use for clay courts. Okay, and the others they'll use on hard courts, they'll wear those out more quickly and replace those. But that way they always have something with good tread, good new tread for clay. What's, what's the difference? Is the tread deeper? Yeah, you'll see, depending on the surface, maybe Perry can help me out more, explain it perfectly, is the tread is finer on the indoor, correct? Yeah, you, you also yeah. need it to be deeper. That's, yeah. that's the key. If it gets worn out and gets too flat, then you get slippery on clay. So where, this may be a dumb question, no, where no. can I find clay options? Online, you can order them. Okay. You'll see, can it'll say... Express and stuff? Clay court, it'll say you'll have the option. Google clay court shoes and that will help you out. Depending on what company they like to use. Like Nike has specific <laughs> clay, hard, grass. You might have to hunt a little, but you'll be able to find it. All right, on to rackets. This is the great debate I get asked all the time by parents. How many rackets do, should my kid have? Should they all be the same? When do they need to be strong? Yes, they should be the same and the grip should be the same. Um, two to three is amazing for especially 14 and under, 12, 14 and under. When you get higher up, you need to be four, around the four range, just in case. Um, Perry, you have any, you think four is good enough? Yeah, no, it, it kind of depends on how quickly you yeah. break your strings, and, you know, what kind of string you're using. How long should strings last? Good question. Um, I wish David was here for this one. He's our expert. It all depends. Are you using a synthetic gut? Are you using a poly? Are you using a hybrid? So depending on what you're using is how long they should last. How long, how, your son, Leo, how quickly is he breaking the strings? He, it not, for a while there was something rolling through that. And I didn't know if it was a weather-related issue or what it was. He seems to have slowed down a little bit, but I didn't know it was a function of how much, obviously how much you play. Yes, of course. It, but, um, it seemed like more than any other time. Well, over the summer, is he playing every day? Yeah. So that's the first fact, right? It's, if he's playing every day for three hours, just say three hours, and then during the winter, he's playing six total. Over seven days, that's gonna break much quicker. Do you, right, but so the question is how long should they? How quickly was he going through a mode of the summer? Every two weeks, like we would, any, we would be. You're okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, if we're talking every day for a couple, mm -hmm. then we need to. <laughs> okay. um, but you can also, if it's going two weeks, you're, you're pretty good. If you're getting down to two days, three days, then I would start to talk to David about what strength to use off of that one. Um, all the rackets in good condition. Usually you might get your son or daughter a racket like two. And then all of a sudden they're like, but mom, I need a third one, I'm breaking strings. You gotta make sure they're all pretty similar because over time, the rackets go what we call dead. So I think it's David Price, I think he said every 18 months tops for like a really good player, maybe a year. So what'll happen is every time you hit the ball, it's a little bit of, dent on the racket, maybe minuscule amount, but think about how many balls you hit. So if you have a, uh, your daughter or son has a racket that's a year old and you give them the same exact racket, but it's brand new, it's gonna play differently. So you wanna make sure the rackets are in good condition. Just from the standpoint, now strings, bring it up, breaking strings. When you start to travel on that end, you wanna make sure your rackets are freshly strung before tournaments. So you don't have the issue of them breaking. I had one girl over the weekend go through four rackets. Not the best set scenario, but now we have to go to a thicker strip. And that's how it goes there. Can I make one comment also? Of course. Um, sometimes I have kids that, um, that use their newest racket. So the racket they just got strung, they use that one. Okay, leaving the older strung rackets in their bag. And then what happens is they go to a tournament, now finally they break this new one, and all they've got left is two other old ones, and they go through those really quickly. 
Okay, so I always tell them, you know, you're going to put the newly strung one, maybe just play with it for like 15 minutes just to kind of loosen the strings up a little bit, kind of like the shoes. Put that in your bag, use the old one. Use the oldest strung racket. Okay, so that way if you break that string in the tournament, you've got new stuff in your bag. Also, you can, go ahead, sorry. Um, I want to ask you about strings and injuries. <coughs> the, the smaller, the kid, let's say like the 10, 11 year old, what gauge should they be using or playing with? I usually would say a thinner string. Like a 17? 17 gauge. Now, when you would, for me and my students, when we switch from a synthetic gut or NXT that's softer, and then we go to like a poly, which is going to be harder on the body, but it gives you more, I go to the thinnest possible I can find. So I actually have my kids start off at 18 gauge. Just from the standpoint of them to get used to it, and then you can slowly grow once when they start breaking it. But if they're having arm issues, there's multiple factors. Yes, straight could be one, two could be that hitting the ball late. Um, it could be from a 10 year old going from a green dot to a regular ball. That, and the body has to get used to it like anything else. But I would say 10, 11 years old, they should be sticking still with a, a multi-filament something that is synthetic, even if it breaks a little bit more, it's better for the body. You don't need your son or daughter to develop a wrist, shoulder, elbow, just because of the string. Any other questions? Good? All right. Now we're on to extra sets in the back. Make sure whatever string they use, they have a couple extra in the back because you don't want to be in some situation where they have a preferred string and they love it, you're in a tournament and they start breaking strings. You want to be able to give the stringer the string they use because they might not have it and also know the tensions. One of the questions I get, what tension do I use? I get that question all the time. You should know it. So on the racket, you should ask them, if you have multiple rackets, ask for a number to be put on the racket, a little sticker, one, two, three, and the tension should be on there. So like Perry was saying about rotating the racket, you should know which racket, because it'll have the date and the number is the newest one. And then you can rotate them. And you know what's going on from that standpoint. Now what tension do you recommend for like a 11 to 11 year old? That's probably individual, but I would always say on the lower end of the racket, that's my personal preference, I could be wrong. I would say the racket says, say the racket says 48 to 58, I would stay closer to the low end. Multiple things, it teaches them how to control the ball better, they have to feel the ball. When you go to high tension, it's more abrasive on the body and they can just slap the ball. So I would drop the tension and it helps you along the way. Ironically, Nadal's coach, Uncle Tony, made him play with a broken string for half an hour a lot. I, I, when I first heard it, I'm like, we did two minutes. <laughs> I was thinking half an hour, well, that's crazy. But if you think about it, it teaches you the ultimate control of the ball. And that's huge, especially at a young age. Racket skills and control. So extra sets in your bag, make sure we have that. Okay, next, other, extra grips. Now, me being OCD about grips, I put new grips on before every turn, on every racket I had. I wanted everything to be fresh. So if I grabbed another racket, it was ready to go. I didn't have to put a grip on it. You'll watch a kid put a grip on it, it could take him five minutes. And it might not even be that good. Hats, extra shirts, socks, that type of stuff, please have on them. And then pack your bag the night before. How many kids come here that don't have shorts? Uh, my mom forgot to pack my shorts today. Oh, I don't have my tennis shoes. Can I play in my boots? We get that stuff here. Okay, inside your bag. Rackets, string, grips, extra clothing, extra shoelaces, everything I brought up. No pad. Vital. You should have on there things your coach is having you do or work on execution-wise. Maybe some mental notes on how to get composed before a match, during a match. 
Also, you should be have your son or daughter take a few notes after. So then they can discuss with their roamer on the court or their coach what happened. It's fresh in their brain. They don't necessarily feel comfortable talking to the parent right away about it or talking to the coach on the phone right away, but you want them to be able to talk at some point about what happened. Now, if you talk to your son or daughter two hours after what they ate, they might not even tell you what they ate. So if you have them freshly write down what they did on their own, then they come to you later to talk about it or hopefully the coach about it. Then what happens is hopefully during the match, one day they can start deciphering it and analyzing it so they can make adjustments. And so that's how you want to talk to them. So the notepad I feel is huge. Um, of course balls is huge because you might not be able to warm up correctly, so having extra balls in your bag to do other things off court that Richard probably will talk to you about um, is another, another enormous thing. A couple balls, it's ready to go, you're ready to play. You can hit anywhere. <coughs> Last is my favorite thing, first aid kit, Advil, or some type of whatever you believe they can take. Because a lot of times you don't know during when you get older and the kid's on the court, he's like, wow, I, I don't feel great, but I know I can play. You might want them to take that. And then you guys can talk about the procedure of what to take. Snacks, Richard's department, <laughs> not mine. You can see me. Uh, bananas, for sure. I, some people will say carbs. Everyone's different, but that's Richard's. Beverages, good. We'll, we'll go into all of yes. that. All right, the surface, location. Have you been practicing on the court that you're about to play on? We're lucky here, we have beautiful clay, you can get onto the clay. But you also wanna make sure that they get adequate, adequate enough time to play on the surface, especially when traveling, and you're going to a new climate or a new place, the surface will change. Back to the footwear. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Warm-up courts. You want to make sure you have this taken care of before you go. You want to make sure you know all the available courts everywhere around you that you're at the site. Now, when you get to bigger tournaments, you have to even know where the little communities are with two courts hidden inside of it. So you have a place to always warm up because most places in the Northeast will let you warm up before the matches start. So they'll say, first matches are at 8 a.m., you can use the courts from seven to eight. But if you have a match at 11, you don't wanna wake your kid up that early to play, so you need to find the other places to be able to play. Do you have someone to hit with? Make sure you look at the draw or your son or daughter looks at the draw to know who's playing and contact them so then you can figure out times places and times to warm up. Because you do not necessarily have the time or can hit with them, and you want to block it off that they're actually getting to hit for a little bit. Yes? Do you think it's bad to warm up with the person you're gonna play? In an academy situation, we've done that. I've done it in the past, um, where I've had them warm up with someone they're gonna play. I mean, I've, I've done that. I don't think it's that bad as long as you're comfortable with it. I think it's what's comfortable for your kid and then you can figure out that. During the course of tournaments, you start figuring out what's good, what works, what doesn't work. Brian? Yes? How, how important do you think it is and at what level to have on-court warm-up versus a dynamic warm-up, especially in Manhattan where courts are hard to come by? Great question. If you can be on a court, even if it's 10 minutes, it's good. You don't need, every kid warms up differently. I've had some do five minutes on court and they're like, okay, I'm ready to go. And then I've had others that want to be out there for an hour. Dynamic warm up, if you're on a court or not on a, on a court, is important. You have to do the dynamic warm up. Now, you might have to adjust it a little depending on your location, but ultimately the dynamic warm up is key. Richard can attest to that one and go over all of that. But that's huge. Dynamic warm-up is the key and some type of eye, stuff for eyes, getting your brain locked in with your eyes and hands. 
So in the Northeast, you have to be more flexible and you'll have to come up, improvise with what you have. All right, travel arrangements, good. This is a huge issue, of course, in the Northeast, is budgeting time to get to a facility. I've always done it where if it says an hour on a Wednesday, you think it's two and a half hours on a Friday. So budgeting time, for any, you have to always budget extra time. It's okay to be early. You get time to detox, you get time to relax, maybe get a snack. Always plan to be early. Now we're getting into the fun stuff. Food and beverages. I like to have everything on myself and I like to bring everything. So I always want to know Initially when I go, I want everything I like. Now what I will do is end up looking for the nearest grocery stores, the nearest places to eat that are good. So I'll make sure I know one of the tournaments we go to, we'll go to Florida. I know where every Whole Foods is, I know where every Publix is, I know where every Walmart is, so I know what I can get from each place that I'll need. And I, I almost store it and I'll have extra, I always leave and I have extra, but it's much better to have too much than too little when you travel. Even if your son or daughter goes, Mom, Dad, why are you bringing so much? Bring it. Even if they complain, bring it. Pro shop, when you get older, this is important, knowing who's gonna string the racket where. We had an issue actually on the island uh, at one of the Super Sixes where nobody had stringers at three clubs. And I was on the phone on a Sunday hunting for a stringer because one of the girls broke two strings. And I literally had to go and find someone way off site. And I called everyone under the sun, but ironically it was Victoria was down to one racket in the semis. And I was, she was like, Melissa calls and goes, I have no rackets. And I'm like, uh, uh. <laughs> we were str I was struggling like no tomorrow. All right, here's the location example. Albany has a lot of tournaments. You'll go through the years of playing in the Northeast and in, in uh, Easterns, and you're gonna see Tri-City is where the tournament is. You'll see all the other places that have tennis courts nearby. The only one that's not on here is actually near the Tri-City is a high school that has tennis courts. Now, if it's 50 degrees out and sunny, you can hit some balls outside if you can't get on the court. It's okay. Of course, snow, anything else, no. But for sure, you can get it done. So one of the things, you can Google map it and find any other courts. Big man. Okay. So we're the week before is actually pretty crucial to starting your hydration. Um, actually, every day is important considering that we lose most two to three uh, quarts of fluid depending on how much you're playing, the intensity, and the climate per day, per match, per practice. It's all through skin, it's all through your lungs. Every time you breathe, you exhale, you lose fluid. So um, it's really important throughout the match, practice, whatever, that they're always hydrating. A week out, I really like for them to start experimenting. Everybody has go-tos that they like. So uh, rituals are great in the sense of certain foods you like beforehand, certain foods or drink during the match. Um, those are great. If you want to start to experiment with new things, they need to start being experimented with at least a week out. They're like shoes. And they need to be put in situations that are match play or require heavy effort, things like that. So you get a real feeling of whether this settles in my stomach. Do I digest it well enough? Do, do I like this? Is it too cold for me? Is it too salty for me? Whatever it is. So 
leading into that first uh, thing, you want to make sure that you're hydrating, you know, starting two to three days prior to the match. And you're going pretty much at thinking about, you know, 64 ounces of fluid every day. So eight, eight ounces of water, preferably water being the dominant factor leading into it. Um, sports drinks, uh, there's a you know, big debate on what's the right sport drink, what isn't. What's not the right sport drink is anything 10 carbohydrates or above. Because what it does is it can really cause an upset stomach. And um, when we talk about cramping, um, you know, sodium is really important, but sodium doesn't fight off cramping. It, what it does is it helps raise and level off blood plasma, which actually helps your body to recover quickly. Um, so when you're looking at things like sports drinks, you're looking to make sure that the sugar content is very low, that the carbohydrate content is not above 10 grams, and anywhere from four to eight, and that you really want to make sure that it is not, you know, its main ingredients aren't fructose and corn syrup and things like that. Otherwise, your stomach cramps will end you before you even start. Um, I tend to like to, there's easy ones that you can make at home. You can try them out. They are, you take a bottle, you do half a bottle of water, you do a quarter of coconut water. Coconut water is probably the best natural hydrator there is. Um, you do a quarter of that doing either unflavored Pedialyte, unflavored Pedialyte, and then you add either some orange juice or cherry juice. If Pedialyte is out, then you can do a um, water, like orange juice or cherry juice or something like that, and then you can add a couple dashes of salt, um, and that'll be perfect. But in experimenting with that stuff, you have to really sort of, you know, have your child taste it, play with it, stuff like that. Um, with regards to uh, water, always the beverage of choice. Uh, leading into the day of a match, um, you want to think about uh, as you move into that day on that very first match. First match, two to three hours beforehand should be your biggest meal and should be where your hydration really starts. Um, getting about, I would say, 24 ounces of water in during that meal. Um, in that time period, in that two to three hour window, you really want to start your hydration that day. If you if it's upon rising, you're probably the first match at 11. You're probably going to eat a breakfast. You should be hydrating at the same time, mostly with water. I wouldn't be doing juices because you're going to produce a crash. Um, I would do water. I would do food, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then you can start to pull down your hydration. Your next hydration will really come about 60 minutes before your match. Um, 60 minutes before your match, you should do another eight to 12 ounces of water, the same at 30 minutes before your match. Another, you know, eight to 16 ounces of water. Day of the match, make sure you arrive early. I can't tell you how many times I get a call. What's the penalty for being five minutes late? Get there early. If the worst case scenario, you know 
you might be a couple minutes late, don't be afraid to call the tournament director and tell them, look, we're stuck in bad traffic, we're gonna be two minutes late. Then you get to know how the tournament director is, if he's nice or her, she is nice, or if they're gonna be mean and say, okay, you're done. Um, I blew out a tire one time on a going to a tournament. I fixed it on the turnpike in five minutes, got to the site, the woman did not believe me, I had to walk outside and show her the tire. That's the worst case scenario. I've seen them jump on there. No harm hitting a tennis ball against a racquetball. There's a wall, good. Do your dynamic warm up, find the gym, get on, you know, treadmill, bike, get your legs loose, do your warm up. So all the kids here know a dynamic warm up. We do it at the beginning of every session when they come into the gym and they do it upon every session before practice starts. Uh, that dynamic warm up is what myself and my team developed. We change it all the time and then the coaches implement it. So the idea that these kids don't have or know a routine don't let them tell you they don't. Um, on top of that, uh, if they do any band work, which we recommend uh, doing your band work at the same time, and then any reaction drills. Find those three tennis balls that are in the bag, find a wall and toss them. Or have somebody you're with toss them so they can react to the balls, catching them. So their eyes and their feet start to match one another. So there's, go ahead. Can I go, how, how many minutes is the dynamic warm up? If they're just like not really doing it, how do I know? The, it should really, like that dynamic warm up is, if they do it right and they move through it seamlessly, it should last five to 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So let's say your, your tournament start time is six o'clock mm -hmm. and you got that warm up court you know, let's say you, could, you got it at four because there were matches at five. So right. you're warming up four to 4.30. Mm -hmm. Should you then be also doing a dynamic warm up right before your six o'clock start time? Yeah, you want, it, you want to be active because without stimulating your central nervous system and therefore your neuromuscular system, you're flat. So we, you want to stimulate the system, it's like one we bring them in here, they do their dynamic warm up. We now know their central nervous system has been booted. And kids are nervous already leading into the match. So, what that usually does is cause them to shut their bodies down on some level. The over anxiousness, this also helps to get rid of some of that over anxious, anxiousness and translate it right into energy. So follow up to that. If they different scenario, if your warm up court, let's say for that six o'clock match, is five thirty to six, should you be doing the dynamic warm up before you do the on court warm up or yes. after? Just before. Lead it in, go right in, hit, and then go right into playing. If you end up with a little delay, it's okay. You're still warm and. They can always, you know, grab a band out if they need to and do some some band work. Okay, last follow-up question is, if you had your choice, which we often don't, when would you have your warm-up court before your start time? That's dependent on the person. Some people are really good at warming up at five, for a six o'clock match, hitting at 5.30 and running out. Others want to do five o'clock, so they get the 30 minutes in, they can relax for a little bit, Others would want four o'clock. So then they can shut it down, do a dynamic warm up and go back out. To follow up, uh, Richard, if you ever go to a pro tournament, they're not on the court right before they go out. And usually they're in the tunnel doing some type of ball work, all of them. I mean, I can't tell you how many different ball drills we've had to do in a tunnel, just feeding, bouncing the ball. You go to another, any sporting event, the, the athletes are playing 
with a ball, they're playing soccer, hitting it with each other, that's probably the most out of anyone, then a ball against a wall, just so they get the reactionary, but they're always doing something like that right before they go out. They might not be doing the dynamic warm up, they might not be hitting a ball, but they're doing something to get the body engaged. Now, this is tricky, making the tournament director know you're there. So say you get there and your match is at six and you get there at 555. You know you have to check in. You check in and the director goes, you're going out. No, no, go to the bathroom. Tell your child to go to the bathroom and do their warm up, even if it's for five minutes. The, the tournament director cannot make them not go to the bathroom. Send them to the locker room, let them do their warm up, then come out. Can't tell you how many times I've walked to a junior tournament and walked in there. I'm like, oh, am I in the gym? Because it is like kids in a bathroom all doing the same thing. So make sure you know that one. That's going to be very important because at some point you're going to get there right on time and the tournament goes, time to go out, the court's open, and you're going to go, make sure your child knows. Sorry, sir, I have to go to the bathroom. Sorry, ma'am, I have to go to the bathroom. Spend 10 minutes. Get your stretch, get your dynamic warm up in, then come out and ready to go. Make sure you, that's a very important one. Be in the lobbies minutes before the official start. That's of course, if you're there early enough, make sure you're listening, especially when matches go really long, he might or she might be the term director and decide to throw another match on and now you have to wait a half an hour because all the other matches are in three sets. <coughs> Richard went over this. Big meal, lots of fluid. So the so the first the big meal, two to three hours, uh, should really be um, broken. Think about the plate as you see it divided. It's uh, you. This is where you get your best source of lean protein. So for example, say it's breakfast. Um, you know, it should be eggs or egg whites with one egg. Um, use that time also to get something like oatmeal. If you're gonna do oatmeal, you can do berries, fresh berries in it. Um, if it's uh, something like, uh, you know, your child, it's a child that wants an omelet, you can do some vegetables in that omelet. They can still have, you know, toast or uh, sweet potato or something like that. You want, this is where you want a carbohydrate that is slow digesting because you're two to three hours out. Um, it's, this is where you actually get your biggest source of protein and you can have some good fat. Um, as you move closer to the match, you want fast, fast acting carbs. You don't want a lot of fat and you want limited protein. So as we get closer to the match, as you'll see right here, um, once you're 60 minutes in, as you can see here, you'll end up with a different profile. And that's why it's always tricky about, like to your question before Maria about, you know, is it best for my child to Every child is different. So the child, somebody might like to warm up at four and have that hour before their match and get a snack in like, you know, pretzels or uh, some to uh, toast with almond butter and some sliced banana, whatever those things are. Um, here, it's tricky. You have to really avoid heavy dairy. Like a, so many times we'll see kids in this 30 to 60 minute window who will eat yogurts. Those yogurts are hard to break down. And especially in a warm climate, never pretty. So um, I would say live kind of in the fruits, but the fruits are different in your 60 minute than they are in your two to three hour. In the 16 minute window, they have to be much more low glycemic producing and they have to absorb fats. So dates, watermelon, uh, peaches, uh, cantaloupe, things like that. 
because um, they absorb and they're fast acting. Uh, no kid is going to eat so much watermelon that it's going to cause what wa excess watermelon can do, which will give you the runs. But what watermelon has that is probably one of the most natural uh, performance enhancers is its L-citrulline, which we produce. It's an amino acid in our body, but it um, elevates endurance. Um, so when kids get older um, and we start letting them supplement with uh, branch chain aminos and things like that, we will give them L-citrulline because you put L-citrulline directly in water or in your uh, beverage, it is golden for you. Um, so there are certain fruits <coughs> like tart cherry juice, which is a, a it provides selenium, so it gives you um, energy, but it also a great anti-inflammatory. Uh, beet, beetroot juice, fantastic. You know, not many kids are gonna drink beetroot juice, but um, huge studies on endurance levels for that. So picking your fruits is really important. Your fruits like blueberries and all of those things should be in your two to three hour window. Same with a banana. So you're gonna see a banana is not really your friend during a match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's why. You see so many pears eating. Yeah, and it goes back to that kind of comfort thing and what you're used to. So in a match, when you go into match play, you should really think about having two to three bottles. One is always water, solely water. One is your sport or electrolyte drink. And one may be one that is like a combo drink. Uh, certain kids, not really the younger ones, but the older ones, uh, use gel packets, use chews, things like that. If, you, if you're used to doing a gel pack or a chew, um, you wait about 20 minutes or so into the match or longer to see how your stomach settled, how your nerves have settled, how everything's going. Um, and then you can do a half a gel pack um, and always take it in with water. In a match, after the first changeover, you do a sip of water, a couple sips of water, and you do one sip of your electrolyte drink and every changeover you either switch off or you do a little of both and as i tell kids all the time i don't care how intense those two games were or whatever before you switch over do not guzzle because when you guzzle you're going to feel it when you go out and you want to give the blood gases time to start digesting and whether it's liquid or not, it still has to work. The blood gases have to work. So um, it's really important to sort of alternate those two beverages, um, either at each changeover or a bit of each at each changeover. And that becomes a personal preference. What about mangoes or oranges before the um, In the, you can do an orange in the, um, 30 minute window, um, somewhere, you know, that's 30 to 60. I wouldn't go, I would not be doing like almond butters and nuts 30 minutes before too high in fat, but things like you could do a fast acting bar. You can do your fruits like an orange mango, things like that. Um, and then in the, intermatch if it's long or if it's two sets some of these junior matches two sets takes about five hours it seems <laughs> um, kids start to get hungry if they get hungry they should have either a bar that they like or um, we use it on tour all the time dates they're incredible because they are 
very low glycemic and they race into your bloodstream so quickly. You know, it's just, kids are like, really? That's it. I don't know. They actually taste well and they work really well. Um, so that as kids start to get hungry, they should be taking little bites of the bar or uh, a date or whatever. If they choose a banana, they can do a banana, but you have to remember bananas are high in sugar. And so what they do is, and potassium, and potassium is recovery, so it slows the fast acting liquids, their digestion. But it's, if they're gonna do banana, it should be small bites, small bites. Not a half a banana, the change over. Yes? What should the temperature of those three beverages be? Cold, room temperature, doesn't matter. So it, it, if you're in a really warm climate and a humid climate, you should go towards a little more of the cold because it'll help pull the body temperature down. If you are in a indoor tournament and the temperature's controlled, then you can have it tend to be not as cold or uh, towards the room temperature. Room temperature is actually better for digestion. So, um, but when you're in a really warm climate and being able to pull down the body temperature, then it can be cold. And then post match. Um, so here we are in the junior tournaments where there's, uh, you know, your post post match could be an hour or two after. So you can do things like a whey protein that is you can literally build in a as it'll sh a carry container. You take one scoop of protein, it should be um, micro-filtered, hydrolyzed, organic as, if possible. A scoop of that in, it'll register anywhere between 18 and 20 some grams. Um, it, should, it should be have a good carbohydrate profile to it. Um, you can throw in some water, whatever, shake it up, and just at least to start to get something in you and then you can sort of look at like as we went back to what did we pack knowing that potentially these would be are we back at a one hour window do we have a two and a half three hour window do we have 30 minute window and sort of use those things as markers <laughs> Any questions? The only thing I would piggyback on him is make sure you know what they like to eat or the drink, what drink they like to have so that they're all prepared while they're out there and before. I mean, most, probably most of your kids are very selective on what they eat, so you kind of know what's going on. Um, my only situation would be in between the matches and say there's a three hour gap and you want to get them food. Nothing heavy, grilled chicken. I mean, I have people that go to Italian restaurants and I want them to be like, what are you guys thinking? Mm -hmm. Grilled chicken, fresh turkey, pro some type of protein that's good. Salad is never bad, light on the dressing. If they don't have to have dressing, the better. No Caesar action, stuff like that. But that is a huge meal. That actually can make or break your child in the next match is what they're eating in between during. Now, when you go somewhere hot, this is what I've done and it's probably wrong, is we buy a ton of Pedialyte and the kid actually has to drink the Pedialyte before they go to bed, the full thing. Now. I've only had one kid ever cramp out of turn over my 20 years of coaching. Because I'm deathly scared of having that happen. Because I've seen kids get rushed to the hospital, everything you name it, I've seen it. So hydration is my biggest thing that I strive to not have a kid do that. Right. We always tell the kids that 
when you go to bed at night, before you go to bed, the last time you urinate, it should be clear. If it's not clear, you're not hydrated. And that's a question you should ask your child. What does your urine look like? No. Sorry, but it's Sorry. a necessary one. But you want to know it's clear, and you want to make sure why I bring up Pedialyte is it's just simple. Every store has it. There's flavors now yeah. if you need to do flavoring. If, you, if your son or daughter does not like flavoring, then that's when you start getting mixed with coconut water. They have clear. You can figure something out for them to drink it. But Pedialyte, please, for the summer. Please. So pasta and the in-between meal is not a good idea between matches? Well, it depends on how long you have. Um, you know, you have to remember that white, anything that's white, white flour turns into white sugar, which assimilates really quickly, and then it goes here, and then you go there. So if you're going to do a whole wheat pasta or something, you need to make sure, especially if it's an hour beyond the match, you know, if you have a good hour or further, it has some lean protein to it so that it helps your muscle recovery um, and you get some kind of vegetable and it, the more that it's green it's full of phy phytonutrients that's going to put uh, those nutrients into the muscular cell wall which will help to you know speed up your recovery <laughs> No, no. Uh, can I get burgers and fries? Right. <laughs> Is that what Raul's having? That's what he'd like to have. Right. We tell Raul next Tell him you can, can, tell him he can have it after the tournament. If right. he wins it, be like, we can go for a burger or a steak. Go for it. Not a problem. I would say raspberries, like he said, raspberries and blueberries, eat as much as you like. Stuff like that is perfect. Always good. And the, and the fresher, the better, of course. So that's why you want to know where the grocery stores are. Yeah. And I will say, if, you know, I always, people say to me, well, we're traveling and, you know, we don't want, there's enough, no places to eat. Panera Bread is your best friend, seriously. Um, it's fantastic as far as being organic and all of that, and they're, you know, there are a lot of choices, um, so I always say, when you do your research, I mean, <coughs> having been on tour, both on the pro and the challenger side, I mean, and in, and in countries that you'd be like, what? Um, you know, Panera anywhere is great. Uh, uh, you know, if it's Chipotle, it can't be spicy. Like. I had Seb, he texted me this weekend, he goes, oh, I had Chipotle and I had gas the whole match. I'm like, great, <laughs> well, I told you, don't eat that spicy food. Now you know. So there are places that you should strategically, you know, look into. That tends to be a really good option. And when you're at the tournament, Remember, it's about your child. So if your child comes up with a routine that he eats Panera at lunch and you eat it for seven days straight, it's going to kill you guys. But ultimately, that's what he likes. He's comfortable with it. It's part of the routine. So just, you have to bear a little bit with it when he wants to eat at the same restaurant. I would go to a tournament for 10 days and I ate at the same place for breakfast, the same place for lunch, and the same place for dinner. Each was unique, but it's the same thing every time just depending on what that child needed. Some are more adventurous. They'll eat at different places every night. Some like the same thing all the time. Yes, Vicky? This may be off topic, but <clears throat> my, someone fed my child um, KFC before a match. Oh. And, uh, and he took a pickle during it and actually was able to like, go back. And, a pickle? Yeah. What? A pickle. A pickle. Is that what you medical. said? Oh, medical. Oh, medical. 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 Oh, okay. Sounds good though too. But. No, well, I will tell you that seriously, the a pickle juice is the fastest on court recovery thing there is, and I used it on the pro tour, and it is because it's 
vinegar and salt and it assimilates so fast into your system that it is better, it's, it's incredible. And every, every high intensity pro sport uses it. Use, use it in training. That's why I was like, a pickle really mild? Dude, I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, awesome. So, yeah, you would probably have to take a medical But, but the only reason he thought of it was because he saw another kid having it, and he was like, oh, I can do that. No. And it, yeah. yeah. No fried food, no greasy food, no heavy dairy, no, you know, when kids want the pasta with the cheese, no. Nah. What about like tomato juice? I've heard tomato juice is good, but not in pasta. So what is this? Tomato juice is great because it's like a bean and it's great and for recovery. And it's you. It, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it on on court, but you can do it. Yeah, I wouldn't have it anyway. Yeah, um, but you could do it. Like I would. That's more like two to uh, two hours out, or even an hour out if they're used to it because it has so good sodium content. So. But more importantly, whenever you guys have a question, please feel free to ask. When you see us around, you can email, call. We, we're here to help, especially this guy. Sure. Richard's always Richard. down. <laughs> especially on the, <laughs> listen, on the diet part, if you need help, Richard's amazing with the ch children talking about what you can eat, not eat. And so if you need help on that end, please, Richard's amazing at that. And he is very stern with his kids on what to do and not to do. Are they going to hear this? I think they can watch it, actually. Yeah, they can watch it. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll be sending it out to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Richard, what about uh, um, post-match cool-downs? Should it be the same as the dynamic warm-up? Uh, no, it, you're, it's foam rolling it, it, it should all travel with a foam roller if you can, the small ones like we have in the back. Um, or you know, it should be foam rolling and then it's a little more static, meaning they hold the positions a little while longer. So it can still be the world's greatest, but each, and the, all kids all know what the world's greatest is. They hold each position almost for like a 20 cal. So that's where you want to get some, create some length into the system versus dynamic where you're pretty much moving because you're going to be active. So now you're cooling down. So yeah, you should always stretch, always foam roll, stuff like that. Do they know how to use the foam roller? Yeah, if they come fit, if they do. I <laughs> can't help the kids tough. No. Um, but you can go online and, you know, Google how to use a phone roller. So, yeah, it's important. It's really important. And it's something they'll get better at. It's just building good habits. Yeah. And a foam roller hurts, it's not pretty, but over time it's an amazing thing. Good. Good? Good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Thanks, Perry. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Chris. Nice to meet you. are well. I have had so many lights on me in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this. Nah, sure you do. I definitely.